In this video, we're going to look at weather parameters and what tools are used to measure them. First, we're going to start with temperature. So temperature is a measure of the motion of molecules in atoms of any particular object. You might also see it called kinetic energy of an object because the atoms are moving. When a thermometer is placed in a warm cup of water or warm air, the atoms inside the thermometer heat up, expand, and change the markings on the side. When it gets colder, the atoms move slower, they contract, and the markings will fall. So that's how a mercury or alcohol-based thermometer actually works. But there are other thermometers as well. So you might have an infrared thermometer, which measures the amount of infrared light that the thermometer is receiving. You could also have one with a metal strip inside as well, or thermometers that could have a hygrometer attached to them as well, which measures humidity. Now, wind does have a relation to temperature as well. Um, wind is moving air, which air is made of atoms. And wind can be influenced by temperature. It can be influenced by the density and the pressure of nearby air or nearby air systems. So in this example here, you can see that hot, represented as red air, is more spaced out than the cold, represented as blue air molecules. And you can see the hot air molecules are rising up, whereas the blue mole air molecules that are more dense are rushing over to take their place. So this could be wind for maybe a low pressure system or something. Now, what measures wind? An anometer measures wind. So it's basically three cups. And as the wind passes by, it moves the cups in circular motion, and the angular velocity can be measured and relate that to, well, linear velocity of the wind. So there is some math involved, but that's not what this video is for. Now here's a couple different anometers. You can see there's a standalone one. There's one attached to a weather station that can also measure wind direction. You can even make your own out of cups and a pencil. Um, but basically, it all has to do with how fast do cups rotate as the wind moves past them. Now, to tell wind direction, a wind vane can tell wind direction. And basically, the wind vane points in the direction in which wind is coming from. The reason why it's usually pointed and the arrow wants to point into the path of least resistance. Basically, if it points into the wind, um, it's not going to be pushed around as much as if these large flat areas on the back were facing the wind. Now, there are a couple different wind vanes. Usually, wind vanes are attached with an anometer. You can see one right here. There's an anometer. There's a wind vane. Uh, sometimes you can have wind vanes by themselves, or you can even make one of your own with, like, once again, pencils, straws, and a cup. Basically, as long as you have a pointy end and a flat end, it can point towards the wind, whereas a flat end will keep it from pointing away from the wind. Now, let's talk about humidity. What is humidity? Well, that's the thing. It's tricky because there's more than one type of humidity. There's absolute humidity and there's relative humidity. Now, relative humidity is the more common one, but let's talk about absolute humidity first. So absolute humidity is a basic measurement of how much actual water is in the air, how many kilograms or how many pounds of water is vaporized in the air. Now, saturation is a term you might also see with humidity or dew point, and saturation is the maximum amount of water that can be in certain temperatures of air. So the higher the temperature of the air, the more water can hold. The colder the temperature of the air, the less water it can hold. And that's why when you see it cool down, fog can actually form, because air can hold less water in cold temperatures. And so you're more likely to see fog and clouds at, well, colder temperatures, because it's more likely for the water to condense. Now, relative humidity is a percentage. So it's represented as what percentage of the max amount of water is actually present in that air. Now, if relative humidity reaches 100%, that's considered saturation, and that's when clouds or fog will start to form. Now, there is a formula to use to calculate relative humidity. Basically, it is how much water could the air hold divided by how much is the saturation amount. Now, relative humidity, just like absolute humidity, it does depend on temperature. For the most part, um, if you have air that is hotter, it can hold more water. If you have air that is colder, it can hold less water. So if you have the same amount of water at three different temperatures, the relative humidity will be higher at lower temperatures, and the relative humidity will be lower at higher temperatures, even if you have the same amount of water. And you can see that just cooling air down from 30 Celsius to 10 Celsius basically saturates this air with water, even though 
up here at 30 Celsius, it might be considered dry. Here, it's basically raining at this point, or fog at the very least. Now, does humidity actually affect the temperature? Well, not for the most part, but it can make it feel like it does. So in fact, it's mostly the other way around. Temperature affects the humidity levels. As we saw, raising the temperature can actually lower the relative humidity. So as far as feeling goes, you may have heard of you know the heat point or heat index. Um, so in or for humidity, if it's warm outside and you have high humidity, it's going to feel hotter than it actually is. Where if it's you know hot outside and low humidity, it might actually even feel colder than you would expect, uh, just because sweat becomes more effective at low humidity levels. So Florida actually seems hotter than it actually is because, well, there's a lot of humidity there. Humidity can do one thing, though. If it's more humid, you'll have less evaporation. So water will stick around longer, including sweat, and it'll become less effective at cooling you down. Um, to measure humidity, what device is used? Well, a hygrometer. So there is a couple different types of hygrometers out there. There's ones based on metal. There's ones based on horse hairs that stretch out and absorb. But most hygrometers have moved away from using horse or human hairs. They now use synthetic materials to measure the how much they expand or contract based on the humidity levels. And one hygrometer you might have near you is something like a pine cone. A pine cone will actually contract or stretch depending on the humidity levels. Go figure. Now, let's talk about another type of thing that can measure relative humidity. This is a psychrometer. Now, this can't measure absolute humidity directly, but you could use it to calculate it. And same goes for relative humidity. Basically, a psychrometer is two thermometers, one dry, and one that's covered in water. And so as the water from the wet bulb evaporates, it cools that thermometer down. And using that, you can actually tell the difference between the two th thermometers and use that to tell the relative humidity. Basically, if it's high humidity, the bulbs will be closer together. If it's very low humidity where you're testing it, the temperatures will be farther apart. Now, that's a idealized psychrometer. Here's some real life examples. So just once again, two thermometers, one with a cloth would cover it. And here's one that has both thermometers on one stand. And you can see there's a little cloth on that one to measure the wet bulb. So basically, it's just telling you how much the temperature drops due to evaporation.